In this tutorial, we're going to walk you through all of the options in the molding toolpath. You can use this strategy to easily create toolpaths for moldings or frames that have a constant cross section. A 3D toolpath is created without the need for a 3D model to ultimately give us a better finish and reduces the machining time. We're going to start off with a file already opened up into our software. And as you can see, there are two sheets here, one called molding and one called frame. And you can access those sheets by the drop down up top here. It's frame and molding. Or also we can go ahead and look at your sheets tab over here in your design side of your software. And you'll see we have frame and molding. Let's go ahead and select the molding sheet and we're going to edit that so we can have a look at the setup for this particular sheet. All this information above here isn't all that important. The important one I want to point out right here is the modeling resolution. Because we're not actually creating a 3D model when we use the molding toolpath, you can go ahead and use a standard modeling resolution. I'm just going to click cancel on that and we're going to go back to our design tab again. If we have a look at this sheet, you'll see that on our left hand side, we have three different cross sections here. And in the center of our job, we have three drive rails set up. Now the idea of the molding toolpath is we're going to take this cross section and drive it along this drive rail so that we can end up having what looks to be a 3D component or a 3D finished part, but actually we're never ever going to use the, an actual 3D model. We're just going to use this profile to guide our toolpath. So let's go over to our toolpath tab and take a look at the molding toolpath. As always, it's best practice to take a look at your material setup before you do any tooling. So I'm going to go ahead and click set. Now the important thing about this form that I want you to look at is that the thickness of the material is three quarters of an inch. And I needed to make sure that none of these molding uh, profiles were taller or thicker than three quarters of an inch. They needed to fit with inside of my material and these do. Um, we set our datum to the bottom left hand corner. We're zeroing off our material surface. There's no 3D component, as I mentioned earlier, so the model position doesn't matter. And our rapid Z gaps and our home start position is very much safe and appropriate for the machine that I'm going to be using. So we can just go ahead and click OK. Now let's have a look at our molding toolpath. Okay, the first bit of information that we need to be aware of is that you can select more than one drive rail but only one cross section per molding toolpath. So for instance, if you wanted to create a piece of straight molding and a piece of curved molding with the same profile, then you can go ahead and do that in, in one molding toolpath. If you wanna change the cross section, then you're gonna have, to, gonna have to create a second molding toolpath. Before we get started, let's have a look at this cross section that we're gonna use. First of all, I'd like to point out that we have actually engineered this cross section to show off a lot of the features of this toolpath strategy. First of all, you see we have some nice curves here, we have some nice flat areas, and we have this nice swooping top here to the top of it. Let's press F on the keyboard to fit that back to our screen again. Okay, now we're going to do exactly what the text said above here. We're going to choose our drive rail and then we're going to hold down our shift key and we're going to choose the cross section that we're going to use or the molding profile. Now you see right away that these have changed color on us. The arrows indicate the direction of travel that we're going to be extruding this molding tool path along. So you see we're going to go from left to right. These lines at the bottom here show us which side of the line or the vector that we are going to actually hang our molding tool path off of. In this case, it's on the wrong side. We actually want it to be on the top side. So to fix that, we can just right click on that vector and we can reverse the direction. And there we have it. You'll see that now we'll be traveling from right to left and it will be hanging off the proper side of that line. Another thing to note is that the start point for the cross section is on the right hand side. That means that this end of this cross section will actually be running along this side of the line. Okay, so this will be closest to this line, actually, it'll be right on that line. Now let's go back to our form for a second. You'll see that we'll be able to now position our molding toolpath with inside of our material. So if you wanted to have a little bit of extra space at the top, maybe your material isn't quite flat, then you can drop it down a bit. But for us, we're going to leave it right at the very top right now. And this, this shape here indicates that three quarters of an inch that uh, I pointed out earlier. And we still have almost a quarter inch left on the back of this for a bit of backing for each piece of molding that we're going to make. 
Okay, for this molding toolpath, we're gonna to use a finishing tool, and that's gonna be a ball nose, a 1 8 inch ball nose. Of course, if you want to select a different tool for that, you can go into your tool database and choose whichever tool you would like. But for me, and for this particular profile, we're gonna use this 1 8 inch ball nose end mill. Now we have the option to vary our step over, and this is important, that as your tool runs down the side of a curve, you may find it beneficial for the finish to actually vary your step over. And so that'll actually make the step over tighter as it comes down the the sides of your curve. Um, now this may potentially add some time to your tooling, so we're gonna go ahead and choose vary that step over. Now if I'd like to, I can choose to do a lot of the work for me by using this large area clearance tool. It's much like a roughing tool pass. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna choose that. I'm gonna select the 1 8 inch end mill for this particular pass, and again, if I wanted to change that tool, I can. I have the option to, to tell it whether or not I want it to machine flat regions. And that is if there's any flat regions on my profile, then it will go in and clean those off with my end mill. Now, as soon as I check that, I have the option up here with my finishing tool that I can skip, skip those flat regions. Again, if I'm gonna go in with my large clearance tool and clean those out, then I'm not gonna uh, want my finishing tool to come in and do any work in those areas. So let's go ahead and choose skip those flat regions. I can add ramp and plunge moves to this. If you'd like to know more information about that, then you can consult our help guide. The machining allowance, much like a roughing pass in a 3D tooling, I can leave some virtual material behind so that when I come back in and clean it up with my ball nose, there's some material there left to remove. Now, one thing to keep in mind with your machining allowance is that you, if you've told it to machine the flat regions, it won't add any machining allowance to those flat regions because it's gonna come in and do that with that large area clearance tool. We can create sharp corners and we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit when we look at our frame sheet. When it comes to choosing your boundary offset, it's important to think a little bit about this. So we have the option to choose to create an automatic boundary offset, which will actually make our toolpath be a little bit wider than our drive rail but will allow us to get any detail that might be hanging off the end of our cross section and bring it right down to um, the bottom of the cross section. So if you notice that some detail is missing on the edge of your cross section, then you might wanna go ahead and try your own boundary offset. So you can add in whatever you think is necessary to kind of overshoot the ends of that. And we'll look at that in a bit when we look at the frame example. Um, but right now we're gonna use the automatic boundary offset. We can also use the automatic vector selector where we go in and we tell the tool path to associate Associate itself with a style of vector on a particular layer and this works just like any of our other tool paths that use the automatic vector selector and if you want some more information on that then you can go ahead and watch the related video called how to nest cabinets for production where we go in depth into how to use that uh, for right now we're just going to go ahead and rename this sweep profile number one and we'll calculate that now there we have our the resulting tool path and we can go ahead and just rotate that around so we can have a look at that. And you'll see that in our tool paths, it's created two different tool paths, a sweep profile, which is our clearance tool, which is that 1 8 inch end mill. And then we have the sweep profile, which is the 1 8 inch ball nose end mill. So for this, we're gonna look right at the very end of our tool path, move it to the center. And we're gonna go ahead and change our view so that we can get a better view of this uh, straight down the end of it where we can see our tool paths. Okay, now let's hide the first tool path, or the second tool path, excuse me, where we can actually see our clearance tool. You'll see that the clearance tool has come down and is gonna do all of this clearance here, which is it's a bunch of pockets as it moves through your material, and we're gonna remove a bunch of material. So let's preview that visible tool path. And of course, this is taking into consideration, it's gonna cut the flat areas for us like we told it to, um, so we don't need to go back in with our finishing pass. And so if we take a look at this, you'll see that that looks pretty nice in the end for a roughing tool path. Again, let's look back on the left of that. We'll change our view and we'll turn on our 1 8 inch ball nose finishing pass. And you'll see here that there's the areas right there where there were flat areas. So it's gonna avoid those altogether. And you'll see where it's varied at step over as it comes down this curve here. So it's made that step over tighter. Again, this may add a bit of time to your actual um, cut file, but the end result may be easier for you to finish. So let's just go ahead and preview that. And we'll see that finished molding tool path. And that looks really quite nice. So if we would like to see what it looks like, it was actually cut out of our material. We can go ahead and tile our views. And I've already set up a 
a layer here called crop and that's got an extra vector on it so we can quickly go ahead and create a profile toolpath that's going to cut right down through our material and we can go ahead and calculate that and we can preview our visible toolpath if we added tabs in and so on you would see that we have a nice piece of molding when we're all done cutting this and that looks really nice now let's take a look at our next profile and drive rail let's maximize our uh, 2d view we'll press f on our keyboard again and let's go ahead and create a, another molding toolpath. Let's close this down, go into our molding toolpath. We're going to choose this curved drive rail and this cross section. And you'll see that everything seems to work out quite well here. It's hanging the vector off the right side, the cross section off the right side of our drive rail. It's going in the right direction that we expected. You will notice that with this particular cross section, I'm missing the right hand leg and that's on purpose because I don't want it to act the tool to actually fall off the edge. I want it to stop at the top of my material. Another thing we're going to want to notice is that the start point is at the wrong end of my line. And as I mentioned with this first one, we like to have it on the right hand side. So all you need to do is just right click on that and say reverse direction. If I left it where it was, then it would actually put the lower part of my profile on the inside of this line and that wouldn't be exactly what I'm looking for. I'd like to have the high point of my molding toolpath here and the low point out here. So if we go ahead and just use the form as it is right now, we can go ahead and calculate that. And we can preview that visible toolpath. And you see that now we have a nice curved piece of molding. It's important to remember at this point that this is not a 3D model. We're actually using the drive rail and the cross section to dictate how this tool path is being cut. So your actual tooling lines will follow the curve of that drive rail and it'll be much more efficient than using a 3D component to cut this style of molding with. Okay, let's have a look at the next, the last and final cross section. You'll notice the difference between this cross section and this one is that we've put a leg on it. That's because I do want this to actually finish off at the bottom of this, much like I, we did with this top one, okay? So let's go back into our molding tool path. Go ahead and select the drive rail, hold down my shift key, grab this cross section. Everything is set up properly. So if I go ahead and calculate this, and we preview our visible tool path, you'll see what happens now. We actually have it running across this face, which this flat face is still right here. We just haven't touched it because we didn't have that extra leg on our cross section. And now you'll see we actually go down and off the edge of that. And if you look at our tool path again, you'll see that it's calculating this automatic boundary offset, which is working perfect for what we need. It's cutting right down to the bottom, giving us that nice straight wall. So that's where that comes in. If we weren't quite getting that exactly what we want, we can go ahead and increase this by using our own manual boundary offset so we can get a much wider um, drop if we'd like to, and that might come in handy uh, for your particular job. Okay, so that's it for that. Let's go ahead now and take a look at the next sheet, and that's the frame sheet and we'll close down this toolpath. So the molding toolpath can be used for other things, just not creating molding. And in this case, we're gonna create a frame. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a look at our material setup, first of all. Everything is exactly the same as our last sheet, except for the actual thickness of our material. That's one inch. Again, that's so that it can accommodate this cross section here down in the corner. Everything else has been set up safe and appropriate for my machine. So I'm gonna go ahead and click OK and have a look at the molding toolpath. Now, in this case, I'm going to be using this outside vector as my drive rail. And you'll notice that unlike the drive rails in the previous examples, this is actually a closed vector. It's not an open vector. Also, you'll notice that I have this green or dark green shape in here. And that indicates the actual size of the picture that I'm building this frame for. That way I can leave enough room so that when I put my picture in, there's a bit of a lip here to hold it in place. So let's go ahead and choose this outside drive rail, hold down the shift key, grab this cross section, and everything looks like it's hanging off the right side of the drive rail like I expect, and my start point is in the right position. Now another feature of our molding tool path is that we can go ahead and create sharp corners. So for right now, let's just go and calculate it as it is. And we're also gonna use the automatic boundary offset. So we're gonna calculate that. 
And let's preview our visible toolpaths. Again, we have a sweep profile or a clearance profile, and then we ha also have the finishing toolpath here. And that's what we have in the end for our molding toolpath, and that looks really nice. Now, again, if we go back into our molding toolpath, there's this option here to create sharp corners. All of these corners have are round now because of how we're dealing with those. But if we go ahead and choose to create sharp corners and we calculate that toolpath, you'll notice that in our wireframe of this, we've got these nice sharp pointy corners. So if we undo our last preview and we preview these new toolpaths, you'll see that we get nice sharp corners on those. And that looks really nice. Okay, now I'm gonna go back into that toolpath again and we're gonna turn off the, um, the Create Sharp Corners. And we need to now, if we were actually gonna create this thing for real, we need to have a vector that actually is the outline of the profile shape that we have. So if we go back to our 2D view, we'll, you'll see that we don't have any indication of how the end result or what the end result of this toolpath is gonna to look like. So if we go ahead and calculate this toolpath, we reset it, go back to our 2D toolpath for a minute, turn on our solid preview of that, you'll see that we actually have a round corner here. And we don't have any way to create a profile vector easily from that. So I'm gonna show you how we can do that. So let's just go ahead and turn that off again. Let's go back to our toolpath. And we're gonna to choose to use our own boundary offset. In this case, for this example, we're just gonna use a quarter inch because that's easy. So we're gonna go ahead and calculate that. And you'll see that our toolpath in the end is now overshot the end of our molding profile by a quarter inch on each side. So if we go ahead and reset our preview and we preview these visible toolpaths, it's gonna to add an extra quarter inch to the top side of our profile vector and on the bottom side of our profile vector. And we know the distance because we chose the number. But now we have an actual number that we can use to offset some vectors with to get us that proper outline shape. So if we go ahead now and take this vector here, let's close this down, we pop back to our design tab. We can take this outside vector and we're gonna offset that inwards by a quarter inch. And then we're gonna go ahead and offset that back outwards, This the width of this profile plus a quarter inch. Let's close this down. We're gonna go find T on our keyboard. The width of this is actually, uh, luckily it's 0.75, so we can go ahead and make that a solid inch. Let's close that down. I'm gonna take this vector, and it's actually offsetted onto this crop layer, which is actually kind of nice because it's actually a different color, so that makes life a whole lot easier for us. And we're gonna go back one inch outwards. And we're not creating sharp corners, so we didn't create sharp corners in our molding toolpath, so we're just gonna offset that outwards. And now we have this vector here that should follow the outside of our toolpath. So if we go ahead and turn our toolpath back on again, pop back over to our toolpath tab, turn on our finishing tool, you'll see that it actually follows those tooling lines near perfectly, which is great. So we can use this to cut out our molding toolpath with. So if we go ahead and hide our toolpath, we'll use this line here and this line here, okay, because we actually want to cut at the middle of this. We'll create a profile toolpath. We're gonna to go all the way through our material, which is Z. We're not gonna worry about any of these other settings. If you're interested in how the profile toolpath works, we'll link to that in one of the related videos below. We'll calculate that. We'll preview that visible toolpath. And we can go ahead and delete this waste material. And now we have a nice frame that's cut to the size of that molding like we expected. And with that example, we hope that you've got a really good idea of how to use the molding toolpath. Of course, there's lots of help in our online help file if you need any more explanation on any of those features.